Welcome, Dragon Ball fans, to issue one of G Fighters Gamecast's Dragon Ball focused podcast. This will now be the definitive place for Dragon Ball news and discussions on Gamecast. So, welcome, hidden Dragon Ball fans that have been subscribed to Gamecast for some time. We know you're there, we see you subscribing to Mark's Dragon Ball videos. So, welcome. Going forward, though, in issue one and in every episode going forward, our general format of the show will be to bring you the latest Dragon Ball news mostly surrounding anime related news and video game related news and a few little tidbits here and there but before we go any further i'd like to introduce to you myself sully your host and mark my other regular co-host for g fighters how are you today mark i'm good pretty ready to talk about all things dragon ball how are you fantastic great thank you so today we are covering video game news we have anime news as well or more specifically new releases of the anime uh later in the show we'll be covering our main talking point of the episode where it's there's a little space where mark and i just have a little bit of fun each episode and basically discuss or critique or geek out even over one particular talking point and this issue of g fighters is the dead zone the very first dragon ball z movie but first mark would you like to share with us the video game dragon ball news over last weekend, uh, they held the Evolution Fighting Games Tournament, which is a yearly worldwide uh, fighting games tournament, which is the best place to announce any and all uh, fighting game news. And if anyone's been following Gamecast lately, they'll know that I really, 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 really like Dragon Ball Fighters. <laughs> it's fact. Yes, it is fact. And uh, not only at that event did they showcase their new DLC characters who launched this week, Base Goku and Base Vegeta, which I reviewed very recently. You can check that out. We'll have links in the description. But they also revealed uh, the first of their final set of DLC characters coming towards the end of the year. And the first character being Cooler, uh, specifically Cooler in his final form uh, from the first Cooler movie. <sighs> And the crazy, sick, awesome one that was beyond Freeza's final form that was super spiky and super deadly. <laughs> and he looks vicious. He looks like a rushdown. He looks like basically a slightly faster version of Broly that's also spiky. But also spiky. Very dangerous. Yes. That also confirmed, uh, once again, a few months ago before the game released or just after the game released, there was a patch. And within that, someone data mined the upcoming DLC fighters because the announcer announced like the audio file for the announcement announcing each of the characters was there and it listed cooler and android 17 and basically means that 17 will be our final fighter which seems odd because android 18 already pairs with android 17 in fighters and having 17 by himself could be an interesting thing because is he going to be tournament of power 17 is he going to be gt 17 or is he just going to be android saga 17 making a weird sort of roster thing what do you what do you think Sully? yeah it's interesting as somebody who's actually watched all of super uh, i feel like it's going to be super's version of android 17 he plays a massive part in super especially uh the tournament of power he plays a lot of major roles and gets a lot of spotlight uh and i know he's developed quite the fan following so i would not be surprised if it's tournament of power android 17 personally that's what i hope it is um because wow he has some highlight reels from that tournament I haven't gotten too far into it yet. Like, I, <gasps> oh, like I know that I think 17's like part is about to come. So far, he's just sort of like been in the background with eight, with 18 just chilling. Oh, dude, he has so many key parts in the uh, tournament of power towards the end. It's, oh, it's great to have him back. And I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, take this with a pinch of salt. I'm fairly confident that uh, the Japan audience or Japanese audience really like 17 they have a, a fondness for him so i would not be surprised if we're going to get the tournament of power version of android 17 in the next character for fighters i, I think it's just interesting that they're going to round it out for the year with 17 mm. because it's like we're having cooler which is another movie villain and meaning that we'll have broly bardock and uh, cooler as the major like movie characters uh and anything uh, anything else associated with them and then just end on 17 i feel like they they want to pull out some sort of like rabbit out of their hat like they did with um android 21 mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember her she was the original yep. character for the game like i don't know if they might sort of make 17 tournament of power outfit give him a few of those moves but also maybe like tweak his move set a little yeah which would be equally awesome and get us hyped for next year's dlc which will probably be jiren and ultra instinct goku because why not yeah, I have a feeling next year's characters will be uh, very super influenced. I think I think everyone's been pining for um, Kale, Khalifa, or Kefla. 
uh, seeing as we only have two female characters in all of Fighters. Yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a pickle. Could you see those two uh, doing a team up combo to form their merged version, or how does that fit within the Z? Uh, sorry, the Fighters formula. From what you've told me, it, you can't just snap your fingers and import characters in or create characters. Everything down to uh, costume design, um, fighting techniques, and skill sets. It's all tightly woven and it's very intricate. So how would you see those two girls fitting in? Would they both release as two separate DLCs or would they release as some kind of combo character? How would you see that unfolding? Like they've got a few options where like the simplest one is, oh, we'll do two separate characters. Uh, Probably have uh, Khalifa in Super Saiyan as well as Kale, but Kale already in that sort of berserker state Mm -hmm. uh, because it'd be too difficult having a small and big character model uh, both at once. Yep, makes sense. And uh, the other option is having Kale and Khalifa as sort of like you play mainly Khalifa and call in Kale for attacks uh, because Goku Black is like that. You can call in Zamasu for minor stuff. And then they did Zamasu fused later on. Or they'll do it like Vegito and Gotenks where you only see the two separate ones for their intro and then they fuse and that's it. That makes sense. Okay. Foot Fighters, the amount of effort they went into, they put a Goten and Trunks model, then put a Gotenks normal model, then Gotenks Super Saiyan, then Gotenks Super Saiyan 3, and then you play as 3. Oh my lord. They, they put an absurd amount of detail for 10 seconds of footage. That's why we like it, man. That's why it is the definitive fighting game, at least for the foreseeable future anyway. We'll see when Xenoverse 3 gets announced. Yeah. Yeah, no joke. I believe you have some news for us, Sai. Uh, I do indeed. So regarding series news, which is predominantly what I'll be bringing to this podcast every week, Dragon Ball's getting a remaster. Not just any remaster, this upcoming remaster that's actually being handled by Toei uh, Animation. Now, if you don't know, Toei Animation is basically the granddaddy owner of the IP and property known as Dragon Ball and all things Dragon Ball. They're releasing their own remaster. So to this date... The only remasters that the Western world has received are remasters that have been handled by Funimation. So Funimation handle all the dubs, uh, the distribution and creation of the box sets. There's been an astronomical amount of box sets to this very day. We've seen VHS releases. We've seen uh, the original Dragon Box on DVD. We've seen the Orange Bricks. We've seen Blu-rays. We've seen Kai releases. We've seen level sets. Uh, Some of these sets haven't even been completed. But the issue with all of these re-releases to date from Funimation for the Western world is that they've all been remastered or taken from their masters, which were given to them from Toei Animation. Now, the remasters that they were given, or the masters they were given, sorry, were from VHS. They were VHS masters of the original film realms that Toei Animation own and hold. So every release to date that we have in the Western world, every box set, every DVD, every Blu-ray has been taken from that SVHS master. Uh, So you can already see where I'm going with this. Uh, We're not getting the optimum image from that master set that Funimation owns. So when they did the original remasters for the Orange Brick, the the DVD box set, for the Blu-rays, All of those sets that are, you know, HD, they're from VHS Masters. And I use remasters very loosely as well, very loosely, because what they deem as remasters in a purist eyes aren't necessarily remasters. I mean, if you want to look at it in terms of them being 1080p and on Blu-ray, sure, they're remasters. But it's never been true to the original image, like 100%, and it's never been quite right for many reasons. And I won't jump to those reasons now because we could dedicate an entire episode to discussing the shortcomings of all these different box sets. Anyway, finally, to move on to the actual news that's just dropped, Toy Animation, the owners and holders of the original prints, the film reels that Dragon Ball is sitting on, they've gone back in and captured in HD the entire Z movies. Properly, they've remastered them from the original film reels. So that's significant. They've gone to the original source and they've recaptured it in HD and remastered it. Now, we're not going to have linked here on screen in this episode, but I'll link down below in the description a couple of images that you can follow through. Cross comparisons between what the Western world has with their box sets and what these remastered Toei animation cuts look like. And I can tell you now, Mark, I don't know if you've seen these. Have you had a look at these images yet or... Yeah, had a, had, a, had a quick look. Looking crisp. It looks very crisp. The remasters <laughs> they've put out is it's significant. This is the definitive remaster of Dragon Ball Z. 
uh, and uh, for some time, you know, unless we're going to start talking about 4K remasters, it looks like how you'd imagine Dragon Ball looking in 2018 if it was to get an HD re-release. It just looks right. So these remasters at the moment, which Toei Animation is distributing, these are available on Japanese Netflix and Amazon. So at the moment, there's no word on the Western world getting English dubs. There's no word on Funimation getting copies of these cuts. What we do have, though, is a rumor that has been making the rounds. Take this with a big pinch of salt, is that the Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z series is also getting the same remaster treatment by Toei Animation. So that's something to keep your eyes peeled for, because holy shit, if I can throw my orange brick set in the bin, that 1080p crop to shit set, I will in a heartbeat, Mark. <laughs> it's gross. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's awful. You've just got one of those uh, bins where you press down and it flips up the top and you're just like dangling it over, just waiting, refreshing your newsfeed. I will make a bin just for the, the box set and I'll toss it and dispose of the whole bin. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a bad, bad set that I have. Um, I'm ashamed. Anyway, you can currently view, if you have a VPN or if you want to shop on Amazon, you can get the Japanese audio versions of these remasters from Amazon and you can view them on Netflix as of now. Uh, I'm talking about Amazon's um, streaming service, FYI. Um, In terms of Blu-ray releases, we've been told that we can expect to see the Blu-ray cuts of the Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z movies to be available in November and December. So if you do want to own the original Japanese and you want to watch it in subtitles, November and December, that's when you can pick up all of the box sets. That's when they start trickling out and they're coming out in uh, two movie Blu-ray sets. November, December, if you want to watch in Japanese, pick it up. Thoughts, Mark? What are you, how are you feeling? I think it's good because we've never had a clean remaster. And, and like it is due to where, when and where uh, the series originated. And like even if you look back at sort of like modern, even Western shows, like you look at the first episode of Futurama, compared to later and uh early simpsons compared to later it is a significant quality drop even if it does get yeah. remastered there's still things like that but uh dragon ball always sort of retained its art style mm-hmm. and uh its animation was always fluid and things like that but if you can just crisp up the image and fix up color saturation and things like that it will do wonders for the rest of it and how it'll age from here on absolutely to be honest i'd love to do an entire episode like as our discussion piece for the episode, just covering all the different releases, all the different shortcomings and why this upcoming release is the version that you should get. Even if it's only in Japan, this will be the way to view Dragon Ball, in my opinion. I've been wanting this for ages. The only reason why I haven't thrown out my orange brick set from when I was younger, like we're talking mid to early teens, is because there has not been, in my opinion, an optimal way of owning remastered Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. I don't know, I'm really happy. I'm stoked. I cannot be more excited. You see, you, you sound very pleased, which is good. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and it's very frustrating when, you know, Funimation and, you know, a lot of the times Toei as well, but especially Funimation, it's all just, it's all money driven. You know, the Orange Brick set, it's still their cheapest set and their best selling set to date, and that's just on DVD and Blu-ray. So why would they put in all the money to remaster something properly if they didn't have to? So it's nice to see Toei Animation to actually be doing right by the series. You know, it's not about the money. It's about preservation almost. En- enough of my uh, geeking out and fanning over the Dragon Ball remasters. We'll keep you updated if any more information comes out regarding these remasters. Um, but as I said previously, look forward to picking these up on Blu-ray in November and December if you can get by and watching the Japanese audio. But, Mark, unless you have anything further to say regarding the news... No, I I think we've covered it all. Perfect. Let's move into our brief musical break, and then we'll join you on the other side for our main talking point of the episode. Welcome back, Dragon Ball fans. Today we are discussing the very first Dragon Ball Z movie, The Dead Zone. 
This movie originally released in 1989. It has a runtime of 42 minutes, so it's a pretty short movie. Uh, it originally grossed uh, 1.25 billion Japanese yen at the box office, and that equates to 8.9 million at the US dollar point. Uh, it received a 7.1 out of 10 on IMDb, not too shabby at all. And a little fun fact, the Western world received the English dub in 1997, which is probably a little bit closer to Mark's year of birth. Yeah, it's a few years after now. <laughs> oh, you know, I can't please you. <laughs> but to sum up the plot of this movie, it's the return of Garlic Jr. Why not? In order to wish for immortality and avenge his father, Garlic Jr. collects the Dragon Balls, kidnapping Goku's son, Gohan, in the process. Goku, Kami, Piccolo, and Krillin unite to rescue Gohan and save the world from being sucked into the dead zone. There we go. What do you think, Mark? Let's open this up into uh, just a bit of a general discussion about the story. But first, what version of this movie did you watch? I saw the uh, original dub um, back when it was, was it Toonami or Cartoon Network or whatever, when, when they used to oh, air it dude. on TV. That was when I was first introduced to uh, Dragon Ball movies because they used to be um, school holidays. They'd do two back to back. Oh, wow. And they'd always do them like in order. So it'd be Dead Zone, then World's Strongest, and then like another oh, week nice. and things like that. So I was, I was exposed to Dead Zone uh, relatively early on, the original uh, dub and quality and whatnot and things like that. And then eventually I got a DVD version of it. Um, I actually watched the Funimation dub with the Japanese audio. Uh, because why not? I don't mind the Japanese audio, but I'm one of those weirdos that can kind of swap between Japanese audio, Japanese music, uh, English dub, English <laughs> Bruce Falconio music. I watch anything. You're pretty much as long as you can watch it. <laughs> as long as I can watch it, I'm happy to mix it up. So I'll be buying those Blu-ray sets in November and December. But Mark, what do you think of the story? Like, g- given that it was the very start of Dragon Ball Z, because like this uh, movie fits just before or just uh, it would have been just before Raditz shows up in actual Z which is yeah, like the pretty actual much. start of Z when you when you put it in context it was before Dragon Ball Z's um very uh, not generic but cliched way of storytelling was sort of established yeah so it's like this was this was groundbreaking stuff it was a little bit zany still so it had that Dragon Ball zany feel to it that's something that Dragon Ball Z had early on as well and yeah the movies had early on it still felt Dragon Ball ish um for anyone that never watched the original series it was a lot more outlandish a lot more colorful a lot more just goofy oh yeah just in general like in this one where um Gohan gets kidnapped uh, by Garlic Jr.'s men, he eats uh, weird fruit and then goes on this little yeah. like, drug fueled uh, trip. <laughs> he has, uh, I, he has an LSD trip. Like that's what I'm summing it up as. He trips balls hard. Yeah, uh, and it's not. I don't think it's the only time he trips balls in a movie. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it is either. <laughs> I definitely agree with it in terms of where it fits within the Z timeline, though. It's definitely before Raditz because. You know, let's face it, once Raditz rocks up, within a few episodes, Goku's dead. Yeah. Um, and we know it's in Z because Gohan's alive. So it it really is uh, probably, you know, yes, you know, technically non-canon, but it's pretty much the beginning of Z in terms of uh, timeline. Yeah, in, in terms of timeline, people's uh, outfits and where they sort of stand because, like, uh, they still establish Piccolo as being that villainish character that you don't really trust, but you need to work together with him. Yeah, a little bit more than a rival. Yeah, and that that sort of like character arc of Piccolo wasn't resolved until like a little ways into Z. When they meet Rab- Raditz, they're they're not even rivals yet. They're, they're legitimate enemies, or at least Piccolo <laughs> views uh, Goku as a legitimate enemy. Yeah. But Mark, take us forward through the story. Like, what did you think uh, in terms of you know the overall story? One, Garlic Junior returning to basically rule the universe through uh, the Dragon Balls and immortality. And obviously we have Goku, Piccolo, and uh, Krillin teaming up to save the day again. Kami's in there as well. This is a very small, tight, and tidy movie in my opinion. This almost feels like just a couple of episodes. Is that kind of the general vibe that you got from this movie? I mean, they did bring him back later in filler for Z, but it felt like that. It's just this very, very small character arc that doesn't really do much to grow the characters because, one, it's a movie and you can't really uh, establish characters and things like that until... You know, when we've when we're up to Battle of the Gods and things like that, where you have a bit of a longer runtime and stuff like that. Um, this felt like just a start, like introduce character, have a complication, then battle, end it somehow. 
it's classic story structure, but oh yeah, even though it was the first Dragon Ball Z movie and does all these things that are now cliche and things like that, it's interesting because Garlic Jr. is pretty much the only villain that I think kind of succeeded uh-huh. because he wanted immortality. Yep. He got it. He got it. Yep. If, like, Vegeta didn't get it. Frieza didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's a very small scale, simplistic plot. So, yeah, basically we see Garlic Jr. get his wish from immortality and we pretty much just see Goku and Piccolo team up to pretty much defeat him. So, we get the usual fight scenes. Um... But let's skip forward to the end because, you know, we, we're we not glossing over much. He gets his wish. He's taken Gohan. Goku and Piccolo rock up to save the day. They're fighting him. And ultimately, though... There, there is one thing. When Goku's yep. fighting the henchmen, they start yelling out weird things. Like one of them says, oh. says Tutti Frutti. <laughs> yeah. It gets weird, man. <laughs> everyone's named weird. Because this, this yeah. was still like very Dragon Ball where they started naming characters after weird things. So it's like Garlic Jr., and one of the mm-hmm. uh, villains was... I know that Dragon Ball Z abridged named them all after seasonings and it's confusing me. Um, <laughs> but, like, they, they had stupid things and then they had battle quotes. And one of them just yeah. yelled out Tutti Frutti before he rushed down Goku. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Don't believe it's, me. It's Watch a... the dub. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's a really... It's a quirky film and I love it for it. But let's cut forward to the uh, the end of the movie. So, spoiler warning. Gohan... Uh, basically having one of his little rage fit moments and pretty much just bouncing Garlic Jr. back into the dead zone. Um, Somewhere in there. I might have missed this, Mark. I don't know about you. I thought I was paying pretty close attention. Apparently not. But somehow we ended up in this weird space, you know, when Goku tracks down Gohan and we're at this weird castle and the sky is really weird. Not quite sure how we got there. He he just lived somewhere. (laughs) He lived somewhere and the sky was weird and then it shatters at the end of the movie. But anyway, what did you think of the wrap up? Gohan saving the day and having the cliche moment where he's like bumped him into the dead zone with his energy. It's like, I, th- I think it goes back to what I was saying before, like on in retrospect and like at the time of watching it, I would have already seen a fair bit of Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. It's like then it seemed cliche, but like if I watched it when it first came out or was familiar with it when it first came out, it would have been interesting because it wasn't a battle that Goku won. Well, Piccolo one was a battle that technically Gohan won, but but even then, it's hardly a battle. More like that's it. It's more like, oh, you lost your footing. Sucks to be you. Yeah, it's just like a bullet point ending mm. kind of thing, right? Like Gohan's like, bang, goodbye. Yeah, like the fight against the henchman was like an actual fight. Yes, Whereas, like, where I think Piccolo sick. actually killed someone. <laughs> Piccolo went to town. Yeah. Um, I actually watched this with my girlfriend. She's not actually seen much of um. Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z. She she appreciates Dragon Ball. She's a, a a visual artist herself, so she appreciates the animation and stuff. So she was quite enjoying um, some of the the action sequences and the animation. And I was kept telling him like, just wait, Piccolo's a badass. And uh, yeah, I think Piccolo killed someone. Yeah, you just see like <laughs> like their legs hanging, and Piccolo just walks away <laughs> and blasts him. And I was like, yep, there we go. He's he's badass. And she's like, oh, okay. Anywho, let's move on to our, our major action sequences then, because we've already touched on some of it. Pretty much the takeaway action sequences for me, um, you know, there's only a handful. Um, it's a 42-minute movie, and the, probably the last maybe 20, 15 minutes are actually consumed by action. So, um, you know, we have the initial arrival of Goku where he fights the three henchmen. He has a really cool scene, actually, um, on the rooftops of the palace, which is really cool with his power pole. That was really cool. Yeah. Um, then we have the badass Piccolo moment where he just utterly obliterates a uh, henchman. Um, really dominates. It's quite disgusting. And that leads us into our final battle with Garlic Jr. Uh, v. Goku and Piccolo. So thoughts on those, Mark? Do you have any favorite takeaways from the action? Yeah. Well, like I, I, I liked Goku's just single fight against the henchman because oh, because those things are always interesting. Uh, and mm-hmm. also these henchmen that can somehow produce weapons from their body, uh, yeah. which is really, Swords really, really weird, but really also really well animated. But uh, it establishes this thing uh, that happens in practically any uh, shonen or action based uh, anime movie, which is uh, they, they touched on it and explained it perfectly in this other abridged series where they said they're forgettable movie villains, where they're the strongest people you'll ever face and you'll forget about them tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. And that's pretty much the way that, like, you go into it. Like, you'll have these awesome action sequences and you're like, how do they match Goku blow for blow and things like that? And it's yeah. like, they're forgettable movie villains. They're the strongest <laughs> people you'll ever fight, Goku. 
Oh. It, Goku actually does a really good job, though. He, he holds his own, doesn't he? Because yeah. he fights three at once. Or it's at least two at once, I think. Sorry, because I think Piccolo takes on the third one eventually. Yeah. Um, but that, that scene on the rooftops where the dude's, like, running at him with the uh, swords and stuff. And he uses his power pole, which, yeah. he, which he never uses again. I know. Because that was, that was his bread and butter in Dragon Ball. Dude, I know. So, I'm glad it was, like, kind of, like, almost paying homage to, like, Dragon Ball. Or at least it felt like it. Because mm. Goku doesn't need it by that point. He's still flying the Nimbus as well. Yeah. Like at the start of the movie. Like that was sick. But yeah, that action sequence where he's got the dude with the sword running at him and he sees the dude come up behind him. So he just whips off his power pole at the back and he just pokes it down past his side behind him and it just extends it into this dude and pins him against like a building across a ravine. And then he just destroys the guy coming at him with the swords. And then he ends up knocking him both down into the pinned guy with the power pole. who's pinned by the power pole, sorry. And just like Kamehameha is them. Oh, that sequence there was my highlight of the movie, the power pole sequence. Yeah, I think it was the one that had the best focus as well, because as soon as yeah. as soon as the battle split up uh, between Piccolo fighting the guy that he just destroys and mm-hmm. Goku fighting the other two and uh, Krillin chasing after Gohan after he pees on him. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's a good sequence. Uh, Gohan's just sobered up at this point and taking the leak on. Uh, Krillin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, that's so good. This, it was oh. all over the place. <laughs> How good was that um, Piccolo sequence, though? Yeah. Like, it's only about 60 seconds. He just, like, ma- makes makes the uh, floor cave oh. in on itself. It just, like, brings yeah. the guy down and smashes him through walls. Yep. And the henchman's like, don't you judge a fight by the first down. And then Piccolo just comes at him and dismantles him. I think he kills him. He but <laughs> yeah. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> the forgettable movie villains will never know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We we'll have a have an episode of Where Are They Now? Like Days of Our Lives. <laughs> but then they then they release like posters at some point where it was like characters uh, kill counts where they were like surrounded by oh, who they killed, yeah. and it's like Goku yeah. had like four people, and like Piccolo had like twenty or something, and Vegeta had like an entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> oh, man. I'd love to see how many um, Yamcha has. I, th- I, think just be like, his I, think, I think it was like a Cyberman and Yamcha was at his feet or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. Oh, anyway. See if I can find those later. <laughs> <clears throat> One other notable uh, sequence that I really enjoyed. When Garlic Jr. seems to be wiping the floor with them and uh, Piccolo and Goku collect themselves and they take off their weighted gear. Like, such a, such, like, a cliche moment now. But it never gets old seeing Ku and Piccolo, like, take off all their weighted training gear and get down to business. And then they actually started mopping the floor with Garlic Jr. for a while after that as well. Hmm. Um, I just love those sequences. Never gets old. And one of those sound effects, specifically when Goku takes his boots off and they sound almost like porcelain or, like, pottery. Like, I don't know. I just love it. I love that. I've always found that, like, part those parts interesting because i'm like oh yeah cool it's weird training gear and it makes a lot of sense for piccolo mm. but it's like goku's uh gi seems weird as being weighted. Yeah. <laughs> like his boots are fine <laughs> and things like that but like his, his shirt is like oh yeah this is heavy i <laughs> know <laughs> yeah, right like at least piccolo has like the shoulder pads so there's something real in there like ceramics or plates or something and it's like whatever's keeping his turban round because that little like purple thing in it seems like it's hard yeah. it's like goku yep. no this is my shirt and we've established that it's my shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like what is it woven with like why is it so dense like does it it doesn't that would surely not be very breathable <laughs> why do you think he takes it off most fights <laughs> yeah pretty much all right, just to, to move on and wrap it up, is there anything else you want to cover in terms of the story or action sequences? Yeah, just going to say, like, in the final thing, it was almost like uh, another establishing cliche trope or whatever you want to call it, where it's like Garlic Jr. thinks he's one sort of monologuing and then magical thing ends the fight. Yeah. Which, which seems to happen a lot in Z films that we'll see mm. eventually. Because <laughs> yep. it's like monologuing Spirit Bomb, monologuing Gohan Headbutt. <laughs> Uh, monologuing we're going to fill you full of energy cooler and explode you yeah it's just retaking stuff again just for the sake of it yeah like it works it works every time but like if only goku was more of a linguist it'd work better (laughs) (laughs) one little early tidbit that i actually really enjoy about early dragon ball and the dragon ball movies is the actual key blasts i don't know if you noticed this but you know, you always almost have to squint your eyes. Like, the Key Blasts had this really vibrant energy about them, like pure, bright, you know, like you're looking at somebody welding or something like that. Um, I really miss that. I really like the intensity of the uh, the color when 
key blasts were actually used. It white out the screen and white out the area. Like it was almost electric. Um, I don't know if you got that vibe, Mark, but I missed that about and see. Yeah, so, like sometimes it's cool, but like you describing it like that just reminded me of the original <laughs> live action Street Fighter 2 movie. I don't know. Oh, did you ever that. watch that? No. Okay. Because they did Hadoken's the fireball as just a flash of light. Like they didn't even have, <laughs> they didn't even have like anything come out and just putting a crappy effect on. It was just like, Hadoken. And it was like solar flare and everything. <laughs> just like, oh, I was hit. I was like, hit by what? I was hit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's solar flare. Oh, that's so good. Our final bullet point to wrap up uh, movie uh, breakdown is how well do you think it's aged? Does this movie hold up in terms of storytelling today, animation? Uh, Does it hold up in terms of just being a Dragon Ball Z entity? What do you think? Uh, I think in terms of like storytelling, again, it's hard because you need to sort of place yourself in its shoes, but it is very classically Dragon Ball. Yeah. But there's also not a lot to it being a 42 minute film. Yeah. Um, So it's sort of hard to judge it on story when... Uh, Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball are very like it's, like it is a cliche now but it's always hard in terms of animation for something that was made in 1989 so over 20 years ago yeah way more than 20 years almost 30-ish it's like incredible animation for when he was fighting on the rooftop or just like skidding around yeah and uh, beating up enemies like he's just there's a fluidity to it and it wasn't just doing the like simple uh let's make a close-up of just Goku and he's making blocking animations. They had like full scenes where all three were on him and you saw him yep. reacting to it. Uh, and it was, and it was very fluid. It wasn't just like chunky things or anything like that. You, you saw the movements in his legs, in his arms, in his hands, in his, po- in his pole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could have worded that better. <laughs> well, maybe next time. <laughs> um, but it's like like the key blasts, how you said like they look like flashes and things like that. They look like they've got like a burning intensity to them. Whereas mm. like in mm. like later on Kamehameha, it's a beam, but like earlier it's Dragon Dragon Ball and Dragon yeah. Ball Z, it almost looked like a flame at the start. And yeah. then you see it like sort of shrink down, like it's bursting energy. Yeah. 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 It's got a rawness to it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And also I liked Goku's sort of eyes in earlier Dragon Ball Z where they're a lot, they were a lot rounder. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much agree with everything you just uh, detailed. Um, I think it this movie was, had a really zany feel, um, which is that mixture of Dragon Ball coming through. So I feel like it was a nice blend of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z. And yeah, I agree with everything you said. I think it holds up fairly well in terms of uh, a Dragon Ball Z entity. Like the animation was nice. It's a little bit dated. It's a little bit rough around the edges, but that's almost what I like about it. You know, looking back at these old um, episodes and movies of Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball, that's part of the reason why I enjoy it is the rawness. But I think it's aged, you know, relatively well. I want us to rate these movies, Mark. We're going to do all the Z movies over a period of X amount of episodes. I want to rate them. So when we've done all of them, I want to be able to rank them all personally. So... I think I'm going to give this movie a 7 out of 10. Did you want to make it out of 7 because there are 7 Dragon Balls? Or just do 10? <laughs> Ooh. I'm going to give it a 4.5 out of 7 Dragon Balls. I think, because I know what's coming, I think that I'd give it, because it, it'll help with a ranking, I think that I'll give it a 4 out of 7. <sighs> Ooh. All right, there we go. So, after... God, I'm not sure how many there are, Mark. Is there like... We've got 4 balls. To... <laughs> 4 balls. <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm not sure what the exact number of z movies actually it's about 16 ish or 17 ish i think isn't it oh that's right because battle of the gods and that is counted yeah so it, it depends because there's think. also um the movie that wasn't released in the west uh for vegeta meeting his brother tarble yes i do know that one and uh plan to eradicate the saiyans which was hard to track down I think we might stick to the typical box set movies. Yeah, yeah, so yeah actual DVD releases. releases. Yeah, yeah, so just to keep it easy and simple. So we have a four, we have a 4.5 for The Dead Zone. Next week, however, Mark, what are we talking about? What are we discussing as our main talking point for next week? I believe it's a movie, again. It's a movie, uh, Dragon Ball Z Movie 2, World's Strongest. Yes, so you can expect that from us next week as our main talking point for issue two of G Fighters. We will also be bringing to you the latest news that's been floating around next week for Dragon Ball anime and series news and Dragon Ball video game news. And if we find anything else that takes an interest, we'll be sure to share that with you as well. Thank you for watching and listening to issue one of G Fighters. Please let us know down below if you are already a Gamecast subscriber. 
And if you happen to be a Dragon Ball fan who subscribed to Gamecast because you found maybe one of Mark's reviews or something else that we did that was Dragon Ball related, I'd love to see you guys come out of the Gamecast woodwork and support this G Fighters podcast. Let Mark and I know what you thought. As well, if you have a talking point that you'd like to see us cover outside of the movies as our main discussion point for each issue, let us know. We'll be happy to do some research. We'll be happy to talk about it. We're not going to be talking about the movies every single week. If something real big happens in terms of Dragon Ball, like maybe a major moment happens in Super when it returns, we might talk about that instead. Please remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can also find Mark and I in the Gamecast Discord server. Be sure to pop in there and say hello to us and we'll chat to you about the episode. We'll chat to you about Dragon Ball. We'll chat to you about video games. Whatever floats your boat, we'll be hanging out in there. That's pretty much where we spend the majority of our time. If you want to find Mark or myself on an individual level, you can find our links for our channels down below in the description box. But we will see you next week for issue two of G-Fighters. Have a good one.